So I'm going to just briefly go over what the neurocognitive group has been working on, but I, what I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about is actually something that's not specific to RAINS necessarily, but that I'm most super excited about and that Maureen actually did not mention that she's helped with. Um, and, and I want to talk about that, and that's a survey that we've put out through the CTF registry. Um, but real quickly, I'm going to go over what the neurocognitive committee has been working on over the, about the last year, just to give you a, whoops, some updates. Um, the social outcomes, this all kind of aligns with the, with the talk I was up here doing a little bit ago, um, but the social outcomes was sort of the, our second major top, um, talk at, topic and target for the neurocognitive group in terms of trying to select, select outcome measures. At the beginning of our RAINS Neurocognitive Committee, which was however many years ago at this point, we really tried to prioritize interest um, from the group, what the targets for clinical trials probably would be or already were, and so we focused first on attention and executive function um, in terms of thinking about outcome measures, and the first paper we published was on attention outcomes, and then we moved into the executive function and, and continued the attention, and we realized that these computerized batteries of tests may be our, our best option. So we sort of put things on hold because we need to collect some data on there and, and at the end I'll tell you something we're working on. So while we're collecting data on these measures, these computerized batteries, we moved on to the social outcomes because of the interest with autism and other things that were going on in the um, scientific community. Um, so I will not go over this because it's the same model that we already talked about, but we focused in this model on the communication and social cognition outcomes and the tools that are available to us to measure those things. Um, I think you know in terms of our review, we're really looking for good measures. We're looking for things that have sensitivity, have good um, properties, meaning they're good at measuring what they're supposed to measure, that they have some reliability or consistency over time so we can determine change if it happens following an intervention. Um, we also focus heavily on the feasibility. So, you know, a lot of cognitive trials in the past have been you come into the clinic for, for one thing, but then you need to come another day and spend like six hours with us doing testing. That doesn't really work in the context of clinical trials. So we've really had to start thinking about are there things we can do in the clinic that can get us really good data but don't require several hours of testing by the patient and their family and completely separate visits. So these are the things we're thinking about when we're trying to determine what are the best tools out there. So we reviewed all these things and I'm not going to go over them in any detail at all today. Um, but the bottom line is when we went through our process, which is a very specific process of reviewing the tools for and rating the tools across the group, um, we really got rid of most of them. And for that were, they were for various reasons. Most of the problems included really poor test characteristics. So when we looked at it, we thought, oh, we don't even know what these questions are really asking and they don't seem to be getting at the things we care about. The focus was too limited or they really hadn't been used in clinical trials, so we didn't have anything to really work from to know, you know, are these effective tools in measuring change in social function. Um, the three at the bottom were the ones that really kind of stood up to our standards and we felt like we're the best of what's available. I don't think any of us think any of these are super great, but they're what exists that are published and have normative data, have something us, for us to work with. So we're in the process of kind of putting this information into a paper for recommendations to the NF community. This will be the next publication for us um, to recommend these tools for social trials. So two, two other things I want to say, and I'll, I'll probably make this relatively short. Um, the psychometric study is a study that I'm doing that is back to what I was saying about the attention executive function measures. In the Lovastatin trial, we used a tool called CANTAB, which is a computerized battery of tests. And um, this study came out of the fact that when we looked at our placebo group only, we realized that the that in kids with NF, they weren't very consistent from one time to the next when there was no intervention. And that's concerning to us because it, that's called reliability, our test, retest reliability, how consistent you know, it looks across time. If we don't have good reliability, we have a problem because then we don't really know how to interpret change. So this kind of got us concerned about these tools. So what we then did is we have other computerized tools we're using in other studies, one called COGSTATE, then of course there's the NIH toolbox, and these are the ones that were rated the highest. So we decided it would be best for us to actually collect data on these tools before we make a decision on what we'd recommend to the community. Um, so right now we're doing a study where we're collecting test, retest data on those two additional computerized 
batteries. Then we'll have data on all three of the top rated and we can then look and see which one's performing best in NF. And I think that's scientifically driven and makes it, um, it's our best way of making a recommendation. So that's ongoing. Um, and then the other, other the thing that I wanted to talk about, this has been really an amazing experience, I have to say for me, I actually get a little emotional about it. Um, but I, I had an experience with a, a father of a child with NF on a grants review committee one time years ago. And he gave the speech the night of the dinner. And he talked a lot about his son's problems with ADHD and learning. And that was really all that the, his presentation was about. And the next day, we were in a committee together reviewing protocols and proposals that were coming through. And I was struck by the fact that despite talking about all these difficulties his son had, he really was not very favorable towards the cognitive protocols. And I thought, geez, what's going on? This guy, is, this is very interesting to me. So during a break, I said, I really have to ask you because this is what I do. I do cognitive trials and you talked about the difficulties, but don't seem that that's an interest for you in terms of you know, supporting that kind of research. And he said to me, well, my son doesn't have a tumor, but if he does, I want there to be a cure for that. And it really was, eye-opening to me because it made me realize we don't necessarily know what you guys want in terms of you know thinking about cognition and learning I mean we hear a lot about it we see patients in our clinics we think we know what the big problems are um, and I'm like we don't <laughs> so I have I had a couple really smart students and I said all right here's an idea we should do a survey we should find out what do you know people in the community people with NF or parents of kids with NF what do they want us to be working on um, so these students were amazing they were kind of red cap is a, is a way that you can collect data it's like a survey they created this whole thing in red cap they were nerds about the whole thing they got into like coming down like we did branching logic and all this cool stuff I'm like, better you than me um, so so we put it together and then we reached out to CTF and said you know we would love to put this survey out through the registry it's an excellent resource it's amazing what they've done with the registry so a big thank you to CTF and to Pam and Kate in particular um, they said sure they reviewed that sounds good so we sent it off first to Maureen who I, I actually knew and I said would you take this survey see what you think like did we do a good job even asking these questions and so she graciously did and and actually her daughter also did the one that we created for younger children to to complete gave us feedback and then we changed it in accordance with that it was great feedback it made it much better sent it back out said do it one more time did we get there and she said looks good to me um, so we sent out the survey through the registry. I hope some of you got it. If you don't and you want to do it, I have a link or my email so I can connect you with that if you're interested. But um, within two days, we had over 200 responses to the survey and we were surprised and excited. Um, and to date, we have almost 650 responses on this survey and I'm blown away. Um, I have not had a chance to really look at the data from it yet, but I, we, we will. But I'm scanned through it and you know, we, we left open boxes for qualitative responses, which I don't know how I'm gonna analyze yet, but I think that that's like a gold mine of information. Um, but we really asked about what are you struggling with? What is your kid struggling with? You know, we put a question out there. If you had a million dollars, what, what is the category of research you would fund? And then the next question, if you could participate or your child could, where, do you, where would you participate? What, you know, what type of cognitive research? And then questions about, uh, you know, have you ever participated in cognitive research? If not, why? And I was actually, you know, in scanning some of the summary stuff, I'm surprised by a number of things, but th to me, I'm, this is what I will take to the consortium level. Um, you know, and I'm fortunate enough to be in a role there to be able to say something about it. And I think before we plan our next trial, which they would like us to do, we need to understand what that trial should be about, what the focus should be, and how we should do it. And that's gonna come from you guys. Um, so I'm, I'm not presenting a trial at the June 1st meeting, but I am going to present what we're learning from the group here and the 650 people who graciously took the time to do it. Um, so that's all I wanted to say, that you can get involved. We're gonna do our breakout sessions and I'm looking forward to hearing from people in the survey if you wanted. I've got a little pink piece of paper that I can share with you. Um, and that's it. That's where we are. Pam says we're going to do breakout sessions. I'll let you.
All right, so now I'll have the breakout session. So I just figure we'll separate into two sides of the room. One breakout will be on plexiform neurofibroma trials, and the other will be on neurocognitive trials. We'll just let you pick which one you're interested in, and hopefully we'll get kind of a you know, good representation in each one, and then we'll facilitate those and have a good discussion. But we're, we're running kind of late, so I think we're going to kind of reduce it to like 15, 20 minutes. We'll see how the discussion is going, and then we'll do the last two. And if it was on the web, then, I mean, obviously, the option would be to print it out. No, I think she means like, like if a group. Oh, oh but, if you say, but if you said go to this web for your information, that's like, that's, yeah. That's, 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 that's like catching the bus site mechanism or other mechanism or other drug. Um, because we know that our side effects, you know, having a lot of side effects and not benefiting, that would be a reason to maybe not stay on. Um, so some of the functional measures might go into that category as well.